is up everybody it is alex from heavy new york calling from the altar again and this time we are here with paris of the almighty agros it is so great to be able to talk with you glad we can finally make this happen an awesome rush shirt as well and it's so cool to have you here because this new agros album this debut one thing i really loved about it is you know i've always loved hardcore music which i know you've been involved with for such a long time and you know i've always appreciated hardcore music as the song itself and you know the meaning and the message and the imagery but the instrumentation behind it, I really feel like you could really appreciate the technical excellence behind this album. When I listen to, you know, Chaos Magic and when I listen to Fear View Mirror and all this, you could just really feel the emotional intensity. Was this always a vision that you've had for a very long time, being involved in the world of hardcore so much? Or was this sort of like a spur of the moment idea? I mean, that's, that's a hard question to ask because I guess for to a large extent, you know, when you're in a band context and you have uh, people butting heads and fighting for power, and that extends itself, unfortunately, to the creative process. A lot of times, the decisions that are made in a band context aren't necessarily made um, to benefit the music. It's more about a power play at the moment, like negotiating to agree about everything, whether it's lunch or a song. Something as meaningless as lunch uh, becomes just as important as a song, and then you just get accustomed to this uh, bending and, uh, and, uh, and compromising. And a lot of times songs don't become, at least for me as a writer, don't become fully realized, you know, or you have to spend a lot of time alone finishing songs, which is what I ended up doing in my previous band, uh, Chromags, which was, I would, you know, pretty much finish the song. So there was no room for it to, uh, to be, uh, bend to someone else's will um, but eventually that 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 that's that's kind of inevitable but with this with this with agros which is basically my brand i don't really call it my band i call it my brand it's um there's no there's nobody i have to compromise with so if i get any kind of idea like for a long time i was considering piano because i started playing piano a little bit and i started writing little pieces on the piano and um, even though I didn't feel I was technically proficient to perform it myself, I began taking piano lessons and, uh, and um, you know, this little spawn of an idea of like wanting to incorporate piano ended up um, leading me to, to take lessons from this guy my wife found. His name is Dirk, German guy, and he just began coming over here and trying to teach me piano in a very traditional, methodical way, which I grew bored with very quickly. And I asked him if I could, if we could just do what I do on guitar, which is, you know, I, I don't, I never, when I learned how to play guitar, I didn't learn how to play Led Zeppelin songs or anything. I just picked up the guitar and started writing songs. And then I played them as much as I could till I was really good at playing my own songs. So, you know, I, I became a proficient guitar player at playing my own songs. I'm not a proficient, like I would be a terrible guitarist in a jam session, but I can <laughs> but I can write the fuck out of a song. Yeah. And um, so I told Derek, I said, listen, I'm really not enjoying playing Beatles songs and you know learning scales and all that kind of stuff. What I'd like to do is transpose some of my music to piano and learn it. And you explain to me what I did musically. Cause he said, you know, he said right away, he was like, I can tell you, you got a sophisticated sense of music, even though you don't, you couldn't put it into words, but you put it into music. And uh, I just want to explain to you what you do. And I was like, well, that's a fantastic approach. And as as he did that, and I heard the music on the piano, I mean, it was like, well, this is not only awesome, but it's 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 beyond what I had anticipated. And uh, and every time we would finish a, a, a piano lesson, I would say, what are you doing tomorrow? Can you come to the recording studio? And then I would just bring him down to the recording studio, and we would record like everything. We record big piano from beginning to end, and then he would leave. And then I would just edit, just scrape away the stuff that I didn't think uh, spoke to the song, you know, because you were just saying, you know, the, the power and the, the, the emotion and the message of something in a, in a song is something that appealed to you. Uh, since I wasn't using words, I tried to create conversations with the instruments where there was always a, um, a trade off, like, you know, passing the baton between instruments the bass has a very specific voice on this record 
and then it'll 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 definitely it'll it'll jump right out at you and say this is my song and then it'll lay back and let the guitar do it and, and or the piano and there's literally from the beginning of every song to the end of every song there's a little conversation between all the instruments yeah so i try to uh, create that conversation musically um because i don't sing yeah well, I got to tell you, you most definitely succeed in that regard. You know, I, I've gotten so much instrumental heavy music, whether it will be, you know, because it's all, there's so many different ways just to make an instrumental heavy record, whether you listen to like a band like Animals as Leaders, or you listen to like, you know, a more prog oriented project or like a more symphonic project. There's so many different methods of doing it. And this though, I felt like it really did convey a conversation because it's one thing to be a total shredder and, you know, no doubting that. But it's also a completely separate talent to write a song. And when I listen to this, I get an imagery behind it. And what's funny is, um, you know, when I when I got the press release and was reading about this album and, you know, you were trying to kind of portray the city uh, in a way from, you know, what you experienced, I was able to get that feeling without even reading about it. It brought in that sort of like, I call it like metro instrumental aspect behind it in a way. So I thought that this was truly just a remarkable essence and being that you know you were sort of like trying to bring that sort of city vibe behind it and you know your sort of city experiences but there's so much emotion behind it <laughs> from, from the cover to the videos yep. to the sound you know I, I always felt like the music was uh, definitely a reflection of my life I think anybody who's raised in a, in a big city grows up a different kind of way and becomes a different kind of adult and, and it's definitely forged in music. I mean, I, I, even to the extent where like my, I'm, I have on my screen right now, I have the next video for Skateboard Fight. And I definitely wanted the videos to feel like they were uh, a continue, like almost the same night. Like Chaos Magic and City Kids is the same night. It's like the same night with the same full moon. And, and it's just, I just wanted to portray like this kind of thing of traveling through the city with the skateboard and on, and on the bike, which is the way we did as kids. And ha it, like, it, it just feels like a movement from beginning to end. And when I, when I started Skateboard Fight, I really wanted to do, to continue that night and that travel through the city. And uh, one of the things I started thinking about, you know, because a lot of people, when they show New York City, they're like, oh, I want to show the Brooklyn Bridge, I want to show the Empire State Building. And that's all great. You know, we have these iconic, uh, um, you know, uh, everybody in the world knows the Empire State Building, Madison Square Garden, and all these places. But I felt like there was some other piece of New York that many people weren't aware of, and that is um, the musical, cultural reflection of New York in the whole world. You know, every you know everybody in the world is uh, has been touched by music that is made in New York. Yeah, I think. We, you know, we revere our musicians, and one of the ways that we revere them is uh, we dedicate streets to them. So I, uh, I noticed, you know, I, I, I noticed all these street signs all, you know, most of my life, you know, the, the Joey Ramone one was, is a more recent one, but there's one for Jam Master Jay in Queens and Charlie Parker and on the B and Duke Ellington. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, as I was traveling through the city and the other videos on my bike, it was more about the, it was more about the, the movement as opposed to like me going somewhere specifically like i just showed my feet on the pedals with the skateboard wheels going i just wanted this sense of movement and then you know in the kid in the city kids video arriving at the skateboard park he's my nephew john Mayhew. and uh so i i'm gonna i'm gonna continue that feel but as i'm passing these street signs i show i'm showing them in the video and i'm it's such a simple thing you think oh music video has got to be action packs and you're going to show a street sign but i think it's i think it's powerful just just to show how you know it's ingrained in the streets our music and uh, I feel a part of that and uh, you know I use the Charlie Parker sign I get people say well, what the hell do you have to do with Charlie Parker well there's there's certainly a jazz aspect to this record even if it's only peppered in or or dressed you know I always say that the the aggro's music the skeleton the skeleton is hardcore but I dress it up a little bit differently than other people do definitely you I think you bring a new face to it I think you bring an essence of appreciation behind it like I think with this, you could, you, because again, I've always liked hardcore music for the show, the live presence, regardless of what hardcore band I'm seeing. You know, I love, you know, watching them go nuts on stage, seeing the pit, you know, the imagery and the history behind it. I never got a chance, and I don't say this like it's like a criticism of hardcore, but I never got a full chance to appreciate the individual 
instrumentation behind it in a way. Like I never would like see like I could never picture like Vinny Stigma, for example, like doing like a guitar demo or something like that. You know what I mean? So like it was cool to get like that sort of appreciation aspect behind it. And being that, you know, the streets and your experiences were really just the sort of like fuel for this fire. Was there a lot of observation, almost kind of looking outward into the city as your main source of inspiration, or was it all coming from an internal realm of emotion? Well, I, I guess I'm going to answer two parts of this because your uh, your um, your your observation about hardcore music live and all that kind yeah. of stuff and the power and the excitement. You know, I've, I've definitely some of the most exciting shows I've ever been to in my life. Yeah. But I, I feel like the musical. The, the appreciation of musical experience is usually alone. You know, we, we sit in our basements, every, you know, there's like millions, hundreds of thousands of kids across the world sitting in a different basement listening to the same record. But they're doing it alone. And that's why I, I think hardcore people and metal people feel so bonded because they're like friends that we've never met before or we haven't met yet, all ex sharing the same musical experience alone in our basements. And, but, you know, but we're all sitting in those basements at the same time all around the world. It's like the, the, the idea of like we all look at the stars, we all look at the same stars, no matter where we are in the world. And, and we share that experience of looking at the stars and listening to music. And I think that individual lone uh, experience of listening to music is the most important. And I don't necessarily uh, think about hardcore music when I think about that experience. I think about Rush and I think about Yes and I think about Black Flag. And I, when I think about Black Flag and that, that experience I had listening to Black Flag and like internalizing all that angst and the, the power of Greg Ginn's guitar and the, the thunder of the bass and, and just, or the, the thunder of the bass in a Rush song and the, the feeling of catharsis at the end of Hemispheres or any of those things, they were, they were things I experienced alone. And all, all the thought and all the experience of a lifetime going to making records. And, and, and if you can't uh, have the same experience with any record you listen to that you might have with a Rush record or a Led Zeppelin record, then I feel like I've failed. So I really, really, like I said, I, I have a skeleton of what I do naturally, which is hardcore music. But I try to dress it up with all the things that I love about music, uh, melody, and uh, and uh, you know, making it feel every you know within this one song feel like you're go you know when you go from the verse to the chorus, you feel like you're in a different scene in the movie musically and emotionally, and uh, and um, and I was lucky enough to have Dirk, and I was lucky to have uh, even though the album was completely finished before I involved Chuck. It was one of those things where I was like sitting back listening to it. I was so happy, so proud of every single song. I felt like I'd accomplished everything I planned to do. And then I just started thinking like something was pulling at my brain. You know, it's like, you know Chuck Lang. Like, he's your friend. You could call him on the phone right now. That guy, that astonishing musician can participate and he could certainly add something. And and I and I did it in a very uh, careful way you know I just sent him an email mm -hmm. let's try one let's just see how it works because I was really feeling very uh, uh, protective of the record and, and what he brought to the record is so astonishing to me it's 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 what it, he made me feel like I felt when I was sitting alone in my basement listening to Rush when I was 15 years old like just kind of like this there's something about his playing that is so mysterious I'm a musician I've been playing guitar my whole, my whole life but when he plays I don't understand where it's coming from. So he's got this voice that's just spectacular. So I invited him to play on more and more and more, you know. And if uh, and if th if I had made that connection with Chuck earlier, there would probably there would certainly be more. Yeah. Hopefully, with the next record, uh, we will see fusing Chuck's voice in there uh, a lot more powerfully. But I'm like un I'm underselling it because even though he only you know, the, the, the contribution he made was small at this time. It's huge. Yeah. Like when I listen to those songs now, I can't even imagine them without Chuck's playing. Yeah. Well, I've always, I love to ask this question. I just spoke with Jamie Joss uh, last week too about this and I spoke with everybody because I feel like 
One of the cool, in, most interesting things about hardcore is that it's as much of an adjective as it is a noun, and it's just as much of a verb. Like, hardcore could go like any method of like the sort of language that we have. So is hardcore really, a, because I listened to this album and I consider it hardcore. I never would have thought like I would hear like the sort of instrumentation behind it. But then, you know, there's so many bands that are called hardcore that sound so different from each other and you see new ages of it. So is there an element like, or a nucleus behind all the things that are hardcore that makes something hardcore? Like, I guess that's a very fancy way of asking to you, what makes something hardcore? That's a great question. I I don't even know how much non-musicians perceive the arc of skill or effort that's put into a record beyond their primal um, impressions of it. You know, because you listen to a band like, you know, like, if you look back over the history of hardcore, one of the most lasting voices is agnostic front and um and you made that comment about Vinny. Vinny, you know you couldn't imagine doing like a you know like at the nam show doing a guitar tutorial yeah. but it's like that, that aspect of it is so irrelevant to them yeah. they have this lasting voice this guttural response people have to them and it's and it's something that they, they've kept with them for a long time and then i think to myself god you know practice so hard and try so hard and and uh, you can, and I, and I know a million, uh, there's a million people out there that can just play their brains out if YouTube is filled with them. But if they don't, if they don't write a song that, has, that evokes an emotional response that, that might possibly last forever, you know, I mean, I, I have, I made a record that people are fighting about that I made 35 years ago. People are fighting about it, like now, like endless debate, like to have that kind of effect on people is pretty astonishing. And, uh, and, and I definitely didn't make that record when I was as musically uh, competent as I am now. So I, I think this all goes uh, along with your question of what hardcore is. Because when I think about hardcore music or the, the fire that was, um, that was really brewing in the beginning when all the bands, the earlier bands were, were coming out and defining the genre, the odd thing is if you looked at all those bands individually, they wouldn't paint you a clear picture of what hardcore is because like, what does the Dead Kennedys have to do with Agnostic Phone? Yeah. They're so different stylistically. What does Iron Maiden, I mean, uh, Minor Threat and uh, Bad Brains really have in common? Or the Crumb Suckers and the Psychos or the Circle Jerks, they're, they're, or the Misfits. They're stylistically, and crumb suckers, you know, like talk about the crumb, you know, the crumb suckers and agnostic front, they're just like, and, and they're supposed to be in the same category, but there is something, you know, like they're, they're redheaded stepchildren of each other. Yeah. I always say like, you know, in the family tree, there's King Diamond is on this side and like Black Flag is on this side. And we all meet somewhere in the middle, like with Pantera and Chrome Eggs or whatever. But, and, and it's really hard to see the relationship to King Diamond from minor threat, but they're distant cousins, and there is an undeniable link between them. Um, but for some reason, everything on this end of the spectrum is called hardcore music, and everything on this spectrum, you know, they all have their stylistic uh, identities. But uh, we're, but it's all related, and, and I really couldn't tell you much difference between the feeling I have when I listen to Merciful Fate and Black Flag. I, I, I can't agree with you more. Like, I never understood. I didn't know much. I didn't think that there was a difference between metal and hardcore. I really never understood it. Like, the, like I, I started getting into the hardcore scene very, like, you, you know, I was, I'm 29 now. I started getting into it more when I was, like, just moved to the city and whatever. And, like, you know, I go to, like, Black and Blue Bowl and, you know, see a Mad Ball or Agnostic Front show. You know, it's in your face, it's pedal to the metal, it's constantly loud and aggressive. I never understood, like, oh, cool, maybe I'll see some of these people at a, at a you know, the next uh, Megadeth show or the next, you know, Testament show. But, like, I never understood that there was so much of a difference between it. And, like, you're right, too, like, hardcore in itself. Like, I just saw 24-7 Spies recently, and that's very different from when I saw Rat Bones and then when I saw all these underground hardcore bands and these legacy hardcore bands so I never understood how one couldn't appreciate the loudness 
of agnostic front and appreciate the loudness of testament and you know i never understood that yeah i mean I, you know obviously with the uh lyrical content there's a there's always a vast difference you know, roger said that in, in, yeah. and street life uh or you know whatever the dead kennedys were singing about and the bad brains were singing about um i still think it's all related i understand you know there's there's a human tendency to uh band together uh us versus them you know even if it's not us versus them it's you know it's us exclusively we, we, we're just we're just attracted to that kind of thing so we create these categories and for, for, you know for a long time i felt like you know we put these monikers like hardcore music on something and it's supposed to mark time you know like and i always thought of hardcore as that time when black flag and the dead kennedys and the circle jerks and minor threat were doing the thing and i thought when all those bands kind of like faded out or not faded out but like stopped making records that that era would be over and then whoever came next was making music they might want to put their own flag up and say this is what we're doing now which happens all the time i mean you look at grunge like what's you know grunge what is grunge i mean alice chains to me is a metal band yeah and soundgarden is a metal band and i don't know how they're in the same category with screaming trees yeah right <laughs> but uh but we we just have this tendency and we love exclusivity and we like clubs and we like to band together and uh and it was for us the hardcore scene on the lower east side that it wasn't like something we really shared with anybody else in the world we felt like that was our that was our four or five blocks and that was just something we were doing and we knew everybody it wasn't it wasn't like uh we, had, we it wasn't i mean i definitely had ambitions to to be a bigger band but that was just because i came from uh my model of what being a successful musician was was based on all the bands that I saw at, at you know at Madison Square Garden, Rush, yeah. and Yes, and the Police, and Aerosmith, and Van Halen. Yeah, and I had a hard time connecting the the uh, incredibly powerful feeling I had with bars at bands that I was seeing in bars. Yeah, I was like, wait, they're just playing in bars. Like they're not playing in Madison Square Garden. How am I loving this just as much as I love Van Halen or? rush or, or anything like that so it was definitely a, it was definitely a, a youthful realization that we could have something of our own that was of value but i didn't realize that at some point the whole world would catch on yeah well i mean the because at one i think it was loud enough to the point where the whole world did catch on like i remember like hearing stories that um who was it marauder did like a tour in japan and like everybody was going crazy about it and then like you know you see like a lot of like these hardcore bands go to Europe and people catch on but I really think the one of the things that was so revolutionary about it was the camaraderie like I would see plenty of like you know you hear so many stories like in thrash metal you know Metallica versus Megadeth you know you hear you know stories in like the glam scene or even the metalcore scene the punk scene hardcore there was just such a camaraderie behind it and not to say that there wasn't you know I'm sure there was its fair share of rivalries and you know, trials and tribulations there. But there was such like a, a unifying aspect behind it that I think really made a lot, I think it, and I mean this in a good way, it intimidated a lot of people to see the camaraderie and the loyalty that everybody had towards each other. Like in the end, it was more, in the end it was, the movement of it mattered more so than any sort of like nitpicky aspect behind it, you know? Yeah, and, and then you have this tight knit uh, community and people like kind of like, the science project of, of music where we're just playing for each other for a long period of time and not even realizing that there was a built-in huge audience out there in the world not built in but like a, a, an audience that's out there listening to metal music and us not even realizing that when they heard it they were going to embrace it and suddenly we would be outnumbered yeah right it, it, it was awesome and you know what you could tell too I remember listening to the Roadrunner United album and like you know they had Killswitch Engage and you know Deicide on there and like Cradle of Filth but then you know they bring out song they bring did a song with Vision of Disorder on there and you just feel that unification aspect behind it that made it stand out from the rest of that compilation album so mm -hmm. there's definitely a feeling of hardcore that no other genre has yeah I mean you know and then, like, I mean, I was saying that that's how I felt about hardcore, and I, I felt like it, it, 
the word should have defined that era, that, that short period of time. But clearly I was wrong about that. It, 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 it just mutated and took on a life of its own, which we, we, we had personalized it so much because we never had expected it to get out of our hands. <laughs> That's why a lot of people reject it, reject the idea that all the bands that went on to become way more successful than any of us were uh, at that time was because you know we opened the doors, we 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 we, uh, we braved the frontiers of doing those small tours in Europe and opened up the, uh, the the path for all these other bands to follow and then and then you know different things in life took all of us away to do different things or at least I did I went into the film business and um, and it just became in a whole you know it, it just it was very difficult for me to get my head around the fact that I could go to a hardcore show and not know everybody there. Right. I mean, every single person. So that again, you know, you have this knee jerk reaction that oh, it's not the same anymore. But it is. It really is. It's just bigger and different. Yeah, I spoke. Um, with you know, how can I how can I take that position when I like sat down for you know a number of years and made this record, and I could have made this record in 1986. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I always try to make my music sound timeless. Like I never use any kind of like timely, uh, current, uh, trendy sounds or anything. It's just I always try to make a record that sounds like people in a room playing their instruments. Yeah. So this record could have easily been recorded in '86 or '82 or yesterday. I, I was... So how can I say you know hardcore is not what? It is not alive and well if I made a record and I'm sure Madball feels that way every time they make a record or now yeah. never stopped making records all these years yep. and I still go to you know the matinees you know and like to see like an inhuman play or something and like you know I see you know 16 year olds there 20 year olds there and you know they, they definitely weren't going to the matinees in the 80s <laughs> so like uh, yeah, so it, it's always great to see younger people at the shows I think it's a movement that it started uh, and it brought its own lease of life and it's going to be there like because new york city has had its fair share of trials and tribulations that were hard for the hardcore scene whether it be gentrification or you name it so but you know they continue to prevail there's new venues that open up there's shows that are still happening you know i mean i i'm sad you know that my 29 year old missed a lot of the classic hardcore you know legendary movements but to have witnessed the madball show in Tompkins Square Park, which I think was one of the most historical hardcore shows ever, it goes to show that even what 40, 50 years after that, hardcore is still making a stamp and making historical movements. And it continues that feeling, you know, about the the loan experience, and that's the importance of records. They don't it doesn't really matter when they were recorded. I know to a certain extent, in pop music, it's all about what's new, but I always feel like uh, music should be like a library. You know, the library should be full of classics. And I don't feel any different when I listen to Led Zeppelin Fizzle Graffiti today than I did when I was 14. Yeah. And I would hope that, um, you know, people, especially in a niche genre like hardcore metal, I don't think they frown on, you know, listening to Ride the Lightning or, or the Black Sabbath album because it wasn't recorded yesterday. Yeah. I think that, that, um, that lone experience of listening to records and the power that they have should be endless. Definitely. Art, I guess that's also part of hardcore. You know, I hope the new hardcore fans are listening to Damage, Black Black Sat, Black Black Flag Damage, and the Bad Brains, and you know, and Circle of Jerks. Yeah, there was a Black yeah. Flag show. I, I I don't, I'm not sure what the lineup is. I'm not too familiar with like the whole lineup of uh, uh, lifespan of Black Flag. But there was a Black Flag show this past Friday, uh, and it, it completely sold out the whole thing. And you know they're always still happening. You know I, the show I'm looking forward to the most is uh, Inhuman in July, um, which you know they're bringing out a great lineup there. So, you know every hardcore show still brings people out, whether they're new on it or veterans. And I wanted to ask you this too because you and I are both alumni from the School of Visual Arts uh, uh, as well, and a lot of people in the scene. You know I know that Joey Z and Alan from Life of Agony also went there, but. Being involved in the world of... Theo from Lunatics. Oh, really? Yeah. So many, so many musicians uh, are on there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Gerard from My Chemical Romance. Uh, so a lot of them. Um, 
But being so involved in visual art with the work of film, I, I think it's awesome that you have multiple creative outlets that result in an experience that you share with people. Is there a similar energy that you channel into filmmaking and visual art as you do with music in a way, or are they two completely separate forms of self-expression? I think they're exactly the same. Uh, it's about focus and recognizing um, what's different than other things, um, what has value, you know, because everybody opens their eyes and they see a room full of things. But, you know, an artist will see where a lens, a lens might see something differently. Um, or when you pick up your guitar, and anybody can pick up guitar, it's only, you know, everybody knows music, it's not a mystery. Uh, you can have 50,000 people pick up the same guitar, and only two or three of those will write a song that'll matter to people. And, uh, and it's just the, the ability to discern um, sounds that are magical or to be able to see what other people don't see and point the camera at it. You know, I mean, in that, I don't really feel like the creative process is any different. I just try to discern what is beautiful or dark or emotional or interesting and and single it out. And that's what you do in music and in filmmaking. I mean, it, it's so funny, like when I was shooting Chuck, when I was shooting the guitar solos for Here View Mirror, like I do the, a lot of these videos and pieces, like if Chuck comes into town, I'll just drag him out on the street and shoot something. And I remember telling him, I'm like, meet me on the corner of DeKalb and Bushwick Avenue at 1 a.m. And then I show up there and, he, and he's looking around like, what are we shooting? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to shoot your hands on the guitar. He goes, yeah, but why are we here? And I was like, well, there's this intersection here where the traffic gets backed up for like two blocks every time there's a red light. And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, when the light turns green, they all move forward. And there's probably a minute and a half of all these uh, headlights coming towards us right here. So if I stand you here and I point the camera at your hands, I'm going to have probably 150 cars coming by and their headlights uh, in the background slightly out of focus which would create all these like dots and beautiful colors and uh, he was like oh, okay and then I lined up the shot and I turned the monitor to him and he was like oh wow, that looks amazing and like you know if, if you didn't have that sensibility to understand how light works and how it projects on a lens and where you should stand and where you should what lens you should use and that kind of thing especially when I'm you know, shooting the stuff myself and I can only deal with a couple of lights, I have to figure out a way to use the light that's already there. So I used cars because I could discern that look and that's all. And that's, I think that's no different than me picking up a guitar and being able to recognize that a couple of chord combinations sound great that somebody else might not recognize. They might listen to it and be like, oh, that, that is good, but you could play a thousand chord combinations and you have to whittle it down just to that one thing. And it's the same thing with filmmaking. You know, you don't have so much time. In, uh, uh, in filmmaking, it's different than music. You can take your, your time, but you know, a film crew shows up with 150 people to a street corner and they have to shoot something. And they only have a certain amount of time because it costs about $55,000 an hour to shoot. So you have to really, you know, as much as that's a, the film business is a business, if it wasn't for the artists who were able to discern those moments to save that $55,000 an hour, um, you know, you can't run it without artists. Of course. That's it. That's a, one of my favorite music video stories I've ever heard that you knew like how the traffic would be backed up there. And like, that's, that's how you definitely knew how to use your streets to the advantage. The music in this moves like the cars move in those streets. I think that was, that's a genius visionary move right there. Thank you for telling me that story. And it's very similar to the, to the Chaos Magic video. Like most people, I, I don't think people notice it because they don't, it's not something they're thinking about because they're thinking about a person playing guitar and they're listening to music. But in almost every shot, there's a train going by in the background. I mean, almost every shot. 
And that was very difficult to do because the train only goes by for 25 seconds. Yeah. And, and I shot that during the pandemic and the train schedule was um, marginalized. So there was only a train every half hour. So we got a 25 second take every half hour. Oh, wow. That... And so if we were up on the bridge for five hours, we'd get, you know, maybe 10 takes, 10, 25 second takes. And, uh, and that doesn't seem like a big deal, but for me, every shot should matter. And if you have, if you can have movement and light moving in a shot, it just makes it much, like even the shots of my sneakers, like I'm dancing around on the bridge and you see a shot of my feet, there's a, there's a train going by in the background. If you see my hands on the guitar neck, there's a train going by in the background. If you see a close up of my face, there's a train going by in the background. Yeah. And it was, it was very time consuming, but, uh, I, th I think the, the video moves so, uh, it, it, there's so much movement in the video because of that, that, you know, that's the difference between, I guess, uh, you know, a, a music video have, being one kind of experience and then really being a fulfilling experience if you have this, you, you put such attention to the detail that uh, people can't look away. And a lot of times they don't even know why they're not looking away. But it's just this whole sense of the feeling of the trains going by continuously, I think, has that effect. And so when I was shooting Chuck, I wanted that same feeling of light and movement. So I put him on a street corner where I knew the cars were moving by. That, excellent. That's just really a attention to detail that is, I think, often ignored a lot and or neglected or people think is not important. So to see you incorporate that uh, is truly a... a breath I of fresh I couldn't air. imagine spend, spending years and years, like a lifetime, you know, to me, this is, you know, like, this is like my debut album. Yeah. I've made records before, but this is really my debut album. And I spent, you know, this is the, the result of so much thought about music, thought about the effect music has. Like, you, you talked about how you've got a definite sense of emotion and storytelling within that. Like, I had so much attention to the tale of making my record. If I didn't put the same attention into making a music video, which would be the visual experience forever people have, you know, that's what's most, that's, that's why the record is really important. Like you have to make the record exactly right because it's what the band is forever. For the, once that record is made, there's nothing, that's it. That's the imprint of it. And uh, in today's world, if people are gonna be watching a video on YouTube forever, if you don't put uh, as much time into the videos that you put into the record, it's just, it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Some people think music videos are like out of date or whatever, and maybe they're not as cool as they were. No, I think music videos are more significant now than they've ever been. Regardless of how you feel about YouTube culture or the TikTok thing, that's how a lot of people are going to be experiencing not just the music, but you as an artist. So you need to put a lot of effort into it. And again, you know, I was, I was weaned on MTV. And I you know, remember seeing, you know, like a David Fincher video for Madonna or something. You know, and that, I know that's a weird example to give, but they were like little movies. And they was definitely experienced when Guns N' Roses started putting out those crazy, long, elaborate videos. You know, it was definitely Michael Jackson, Thriller, all that stuff, you know, like we were, the, 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 expect, the expectation level we had of what a music video would be was so powerful. And then they just kind of vanished. And I just felt like there was a void for creating videos that were that same kind of like cinematic experience. And that's really what I try to do with Chaos Magic. I mean, I, I've told this story before, but, um, you know, I wrote the songs for myself. You know, they were, it was like a personal thing. I didn't write these songs to make a record. I, I you know, cause I'm so immersed in the film business. I kind of was just doing it um, out of my love for doing it. And I was trying to think of a context to put the songs in because I really wasn't doing a band thing. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll write a story about a band. Because all this music will be uh, the, band, the music the band writes in the show, in the TV show. And uh, and after I had a bunch of uh, Chaos Magic finished, I was like, oh, I, I, I really want people to understand, like the people that I'm pitching the TV show idea to, to understand what it would look like, what, it, what New York looks like. And, and to a large extent these days, New York looks different to people from the outside. It looks like Gossip Girl. It looks like Sex in the City. It looks like this kind of like very white, you know, girls clocking down the street in their high heels type thing. And my memory of the city is different. It's very dark and it's, uh, it's the city of my youth. 
So I wanted the TV show to look like that. So I made Chaos Magic to show people what the show would look like. You know, show them the New York of my memory. And then after I made the video, my wife was just like, oh God, you gotta put this out. I was like, yeah, but this, yeah. she was like, no, no, no. There's <laughs> okay, and that's, that's really when, and the, and the band's name and the story was the Agros. I love this, um, I love this. So was, when are we gonna, okay, okay, it was in the dressing corner at the Agros. Because I had been playing with Cobbs, the drummer who played on the record, and we, we bandied about a couple of names, which doesn't matter now. But, uh, and up until the day I decided on this name, or, or taking this name out of the screenplay and just putting it on the record. Uh, it, it could have been any number of things. Yeah. yeah. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time, for such an awesome conversation, and for such a great story uh, just behind this album, just with Rise of the Agros out. Can we be expecting anything else in terms of live shows or more new music? What else would you like to plug uh, for the making of this? Well, first and foremost, the album. Yep. Of course. Get this album on my website, agros.nyc. Uh, we also have it on CD. And then we're gonna uh, we're gonna be launching a, a band camp page at the end of the month. And um, in July, I'm doing a short East Coast tour, which will start at St. Vitus on July 5th, and then go up the East Coast through Camden and down. It'll be a 14 day um, tour. So please come out and see us play. I'll be there. I think it's live. It'll be me and Derek and uh, Chuck Lenahan, and uh, it'll be awesome. And uh, that's really it. Awesome. Just, you know, check out the record. You can watch the video, two, two of the videos right now on YouTube uh, City Kids, which is actually three songs. It's nine minutes long. And uh, I worked harder on that than I've worked on anything in my life. I, I edited from the, if to make the deadlines to get that video done, I think I worked for like 48 hours straight sitting right where I am editing. And my wife was like bringing me meals and going to bed and bringing me meals and going to bed. <laughs> and uh, the Chaos Magic music video and both those songs were on this record and, uh, and much more. So get the record and come and see us play in July. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Paris of Agros. Be sure to check out Rise of the Agros. Catch them on their tour this summer. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Alex.